Okay, uh, hello everyone. Hello everyone, can I have your attention? And uh, I'm still out of the mouth. Yes, I'm <laughs> excited. <laughs> so, welcome everyone to uh, today's uh, uh, Nature Recovery Seminar, which is the uh, one of the last ones of this term. So, this is a series that we started this term and uh, focusing all elements of, of, of nature, uh, uh, particularly focused on nature recovery. And next time we'll have a whole new series of, of talks uh, over that as well. So, so, so if you want to uh, be on, uh, just uh, if you're not on it already, just email biodiversity at ouce.ox.ac.uk and, and you can be on our mailing list. And after this event today, uh, there's a drinks reception uh, around the corner and also copies of guys, both of Guy's books available. Uh, there right. as well. Uh, I, I'm going to set the show up for Guy. I'm not sure how we'll squeeze everyone into that room. Everyone goes, but that's it. But uh, you're all welcome to join us uh, afterwards for a more informal conversation. Uh, just before I introduce Guy, uh, uh, is next week at this same time, and that's Eric Lundgren from Aarhus University in in Denmark talking about introduced megafauna and the biological reality of native species. Uh, so that'll be one about. The, the controversy is about non-native animals being reintroduced and rewilding experiments. This should be quite an interesting uh, 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 seminar as well. So now to introduce Guy. So Guy is a writer and environmental campaigner. He's worked uh, a number of roles for Rewilding Britain, uh, for Friends of the Earth, UK uh, uh, government Stepra, uh, and uh, New, New Zealand's Ministry of Agriculture. And he's written wild, wildly for publications, including The Guardian and The New Statesman, and a few years ago, he wrote a book on a, on a related but quite different theme, Who Owns England, uh, which is also a, a really interesting read if, 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 you're, uh, if you want to explore that further, uh, which was a sort of Sunday Times bestseller. And then Guy's new book, which is a sub subject of today's talk, The Lost Rainforest of Britain, uh, uh, just came out uh, last month, I believe, and, uh, uh, and it's uh, getting a lot of attention. In fact, you might have seen in the press, and uh, you can welcome to dive into it after this talk. So thanks for joining us, Guy. Over to you. Thank you very much, Zivindi. Yeah, thanks so much for inviting me. Um, I'll, uh, I'll get my disclaimers in first. I'm not a trained ecologist or botanist. I'm, I read history uh, and it's very slightly intimidating to be talking to some of the world's eminent, most eminent ecologists and woodland experts. Um, but I hope, if anything, if nothing else, that my talk inspires um, some real research to be done by, by some of you guys. So um, hopefully, uh, hopefully you'll enjoy it. Um, so just to begin with, this is the front cover to my book, Lost Rainforest of Britain. Um, not a photo, but a, a watercolour by the artist Alan Lee. And Alan Lee is better known as the illustrator of the works of Tolkien. And um, I first met Alan last year when I realised that he lived um, just up the road from me, uh, living on the outskirts of Dartmoor, and that he'd moved there in the 70s and had suddenly become um, utterly entranced and inspired by... Uh, Dartmoor's wet woodlands and if you flip back through some of uh, Alan's amazing uh, illustrated uh, version, you know, versions of Tolkien, The Lord of the Rings and so on, you start to realise that um, actually his depictions of places like Fangorn Forest and uh, the tree beard and the Ents all dripping with lichens are of many of Dartmoor's temperate rainforests and so uh, I had to get in touch with him in order to meet him and, and talk to him and he features as a, a star, has a star rolling on the chapters of my books, but I then cheekily asked him whether he'd like to illustrate the cover and to my absolute glee, he said yes. So that was a fulfillment of a childhood dream. So um, obviously never judge a book by its cover, except for this one, because it's by far the best books about it. Um, but to show you um, a picture of some actual temperate rainforest, see if this works, which, okay, there we go. Um, this is some actual temperate rainforest in Britain. Uh, it's Black Tour Copse on, uh, in the middle of Dartmoor, one of the three remaining upland oak woods um, in, in Dartmoor, on Dartmoor itself. Um, and I think this gives you a, a sense of what we mean when we talk about temperate rainforest in Britain. Um, we do have rainforest here. It, it's not just something that occurs in tropical climates. Of course, in the tropics, tropical rainforest is uh, rainy and hot, and temperate rainforest is rainy but cool. And we get it in temperate climates such as in uh, Chile and Argentina, Japan, uh, New Zealand, the Antipodes, but also uh, in Western Europe. And it's in very, very tiny fragments in 
in places like in, in the west coast of Britain and the west coast of Ireland. And I'll explore more about attempting to map it in a, in a minute. But really, what, what defines the temperate rainforest? Well, firstly, the sheer amount of rainfall. Um, by some measures, uh, Paul Alabak, who did a study of temperate rainforests around the world about 30 years ago, he uh, drew, drew the line at around 1400 millimeters of rainfall in a year on average. We have that in places like Dartmoor. Uh, and don't I know it from going out there plenty of times and getting soaked. Um, have that in, uh, up and down the west coast of Britain. And it's that, um, that very rainy and mild equable climate that allows epiphytes to grow in fusion, plants that grow on other plants. And that's what we're seeing here on the branches of these gnarled and twisted old oak trees and black tall cops, the lichens, the ferns, the mosses. And I'll explore a bit more about some of what some of those comprise in a bit. Where's this? Anybody know? I heard somebody whisper it. Wisman's Wood. This is probably the most famous fragment of temperate rainforest in Britain, Wisman's Wood. Um, I think you can get a sense that this is not a photo of mine, much more professional photographer took this, a um, guy called Tom Williams. And I think you can get a sense of the sort of microclimates that also exist in some of our temperate rainforests here, that mist that's swept in off the moor and is clean from trees and the, everything dripping uh, with moisture uh, and the um, all the mosses that are covering every surface, all the, the boulder field there that uh, Wisman's grows in and from which it's protected by sheep, uh, but also the, 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 the epiphytes growing from the branches. And well, Wisman's wood and black tall cockles of Atlantic oak woods, um, our temperate rainforests are not necessarily entirely defined by the, simply the species of tree that grows in them, more by the climate. And another, another sort of a type or flavour of temperate rainforest that you get in parts of the British Isles is Atlantic hazelwood, uh, even rarer. And it's something that has, I think, really only recently been recognised as forming habitat in its own right, um, a type of woodland. Um, um, Sandy and Brian Coppins have written an entire book about it. Um, an absolutely fantastic and wonderful, very rare ecosystem that occurs mostly in Western Scotland. Um, but um, perhaps small fragments of it may exist elsewhere. This is a, an old, un, seemingly uncoppiced uh, hazel stand that I found um, on, on, the, uh, on the western edge of Dartmoor, a place called Sanford Spiny. And you get, uh, you know, perhaps we we've seem to sort of denigrate hazel trees as being a, sort of a species that only is found in the understory of woods uh, rather than forming habitats of its own uh, where it's the majority species. Um, and uh, we're very used to seeing coppiced hazel, um, but actually here you get you can see that actually when it's been left to grow for for decades, uh, perhaps centuries, uh, without being coppiced, it can you know, form these very contorted structures uh, and covered in covered in epiphytes and rare lichens as well. To give you some examples of some of the epiphytes that grow in our temperate rainforest, this is one that's quite common: uh, polypody fern. I love how when you catch it with the sunlight glinting through it, I think it looks a bit like a kind of stained glass window effect. Um, this one, these are growing on some willow trees um, growing on a place called the O Brook on Dartmoor, where there's some interesting regeneration going on due to a, probably a reduction in grazing. Um, but it's quite common. Um, you probably do find it in, in areas outside of strictly the temperate rainforest zone. Um, but uh, far rarer, and perhaps my favourite um, since getting into this, is tree lungwort, Laveria pulmonaria, one of the old growth lichens of our, of our, of our ancient woodlands. Um, and now tends to be found mostly in the west of Britain where uh, it's wettest and also the, the, the air is purest and, and, most, and most clean, uh, having been least affected by the industrial revolution by acid rain. Um, it gets its slightly odd and uh, slightly odd medieval herbalists who were besotted by the medieval doctrine of signatures um, where they were, were upon they um, looked at looked at plants that they believed to have a uh, medicinal value and said, well, it sort of looks a little bit like a lung. So it probably has something to do with curing pulmonary diseases. Um, and uh, you know, maybe we'll give it to people who've got you know coughs and colds. Um, I should hasten to add that it, there is no uh, known scientific evidence that it does have such medicinal properties. So um, besides it being very, very rare, please, please be, do, do not be tempted to go and uh, pick it and and to try it as a medicinal cure yourself. A couple of other examples uh, of epiphytes in our temperate rainforest. Filmy fern, 
um, despite it looking it being extremely small and looking more like a kind of liverwort or graphite of some kind, it's, it is still a fern. Um, I think its uh, fronds are about one cell thick. Um, it looks absolutely amazing. You get huge clumps growing in some of the wettest parts of our temperate rainforest, particularly underneath waterfalls and uh, around streams. And this slightly less savoury looking character here is Sticta sylvatica, um, uh, one of our temperate rainforest lichens. Uh, and for reasons unbeknownst to me, it smells uh, of rotting fish. So if someone can explain to me why it has that um, evol an evolutionary advantage as a result of that, I'd be very interested to know. Um, but um, what I love about our rainforests are how weird some of the denizens that live in them. And I think are here, string of sausages lichen, which particularly is found in the West Country, um, growing, uh, festooning entire trees on, uh, on, in parts of Dartmoor and Cornwall. And uh, hazel gloves fungus, perhaps my favourite of all, um, which a conservationist once described to me as looking like Donald Trump's tiny orange hands, or possibly another part of his anatomy also to scale. Um, but uh, don't let that uh, put you off going and looking for it, because um, I think it's uh, a fungus. I think there's more to be discovered about this, more research to be done into it. Um, and I've been very excited that since my book came out that um, people have been coming up to me at the end of, of talks and saying, I found this. I found this on my farm in Devon, a sheep farmer. I found this on my farm in Devon. It's made me feel like this land is even more special to me. Um, and, you know, because there's actually been um, very little research done into this, I believe, to this fungus that actually um, those, those uh, farmers and, and uh, amateur botanists who are starting to uh, discover it growing in all sorts of unusual places. This, this is actually shown to be by a young botanist uh, in, Corn in Cornwall um, who found it on the outskirts of an industrial estate in Bodmin um, that you know, we can start to actually add to uh, the picture of where we are still finding fragments of, of temperate rainforest. And it's not just about the flora, it's also the fauna that um, are supported by our rainforests. Um, the blue ground beetle uh, is one such uh, invertebrate found in only a few sites uh, around Dartmoor and in South Wales and recently discovered at two more sites, but um, only, only, a, only a handful in total. And it, uh, I witnessed it myself emerging at night as it comes out to prey on giant slugs. So it's a, a lovely, very large ground beetle. And um, you know what I think I've hopefully given you a, a sense of here is that our temporary infrastructure are amongst the pinnacle in terms of the biodiversity they support, particularly in terms of the uh, you know, lower plants as they're sometimes referred to. I think, uh, I think unfairly, I think we've um, overlooked perhaps in this country our, our uh, lichens and, and uh, bryophytes for, for too long, certainly in terms of popular culture. I think um, you know, this is something that I realized in myself a couple of years ago that I was suffering from plant blindness, that I, I really only saw uh, plants as a kind of massive green and didn't really distinguish between them and diversity that we have uh, out there and particularly in our western western wet woodlands where where there are you know around 500 species of lichens that are supported by our temperate rainforests and something like 160 types of uh, bryophytes. And um, but besides that as well, besides that, they are clearly crucial allies in the fight against the climate crisis. And obviously, woodlands, all, all types of woodlands, are locking up carbon in their in the woody matter of their trunks and, um, and branches, and in the um, forest floor. But also um, something may be going on in our temperate rainforest. In addition to that, which you can see happening here, which is that the soil that's forming in the canopy of the trees as well, because we have generations of mosses and lichens living and dying on these branches, bound together by the rhizomes of, of the polypody ferns that you can see clinging on here and forming this kind of root ball. And perhaps uh, there is uh, soil, soil carbon being generated in the forest canopy here. Certainly that's something that's been uh, shown to be happening in tropical rainforests. And I wonder if, if, if someone might take up the baton and explore, do some research into whether this is happening in our temperate rainforests as well. So where do we find rainforests in Britain? Um, you know, when I first moved to the West Country about two and a half years ago, I quickly fell in love with the fragments of rainforest I was finding on the outskirts of Dartmoor and other parts of the, of, of the West Country. But um, it was something where I thought, well, clearly other people have looked into this. I started reading some of the work of ecologists and botanists to kind of uh, map and, and explore these habitats. But I also thought I should do perhaps a little bit of citizen science 
by asking just people if they had spotted them themselves and set up a blog, started a Google map, this one here, and sent out a request on Twitter. And people soon were sending me hundreds of submissions of, of wet woodlands that they'd found on their you know, lockdown walks or you know, thought they'd witnessed and probably pretty fair to send me photos of them. Uh, and some of them were starting to get into the um, trying to um, uh, look for some of the rarer lichens and rarefights too. And so, you know, this this was obviously a you know this bit of citizen science wasn't hugely scientific. I fully admit that the guidelines I gave to people were kind of quite basic, kind of looking for you know quite a common epiphyte, polypody fern, which probably does occur outside of the the rainforest zone. But um, but I think it was also um, a really interesting exercise in trying to engage people and also to kind of understand that you know there is this sort of uh, latent interest I think in in nature and botany that perhaps has started to you know bleed out of our formal education systems these days that you know there is no my understanding is there's no botany courses being taught at graduate level anymore and and obviously we're only just starting to talk about reintroducing natural history as a, a GCSE level so you know I hope uh, I hope if, if nothing else that that was uh, started to kind of engage people some people in um, looking for plants in their area again. But I knew that there was obviously more to do to kind of engage with the details of the, the data about uh, where our temperate rainforest might be found. So I started um, working with a professional GIS uh, digital map maker, Tim Richards, to try and map Britain's temperate rainforest zone. Uh, and um, we built up on the work that had been done previously by Professor Krista Ellis, the Royal Botanic Gardens in Edinburgh, to map temperate rainforest in a uh, sort to improve on Dean looking at this issue and um, by using more recent and more detailed Met Office uh, rainfall records and temperature records to try and build up a picture of the sorts of climate that we, uh, we, we might expect rainforest to thrive. And that's shown in this map here on the left, um, the starting in green and going into uh, blues and purples, simply indicating um, using this index of hydrothermy, how much wetter it uh, and, and, and better it can be in places like the north of uh, Wales and western Scotland uh, for this habitat to thrive um, in, 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 sort of in its most profuse form. Um, but in terms of what actually is left, um, you know, we've got a, rain, a rainforest zone, we think, in Britain that covers something like 20% of the country, but what actually is left in terms of actual rainforest fragments is far less, something more like 1% of the country. And just to say a little bit more about the methodology we use to try and produce something that uh, are far from perfect and I hope others will be able to build upon. But um, as I mentioned, the rainforest zone, the, the kind of climatic map was, was built using uh, kind of uh, an equation that combines Met Office rainfall and temperature data. Uh, rainforest fragments, we ended up alighting on using ancient woodland inventory data for the uh, and merging them together for England, Wales, and Scotland, simply because there didn't seem to be uh, anything else so comprehensive. Um, a, a, a polygon map of, of woodlands of the right sort of type. We were keen to find anything else, any other data sets out there, looked at for um, national vegetation classification data sets. Um, at seemingly, although this had been started as a, as a huge endeavor back in the 80s, there still seems to be no comprehensive polygon map of um, MVC woodlands for the whole of Britain, which is um, a great shame. But um, so we were, we were sort of fell back on some of the work, work that had been done to look at um, ancient woodland and, and the, uh, clearly um, some of the species that inhabit our, our temperate rainforests uh, take a long time to, to colonize and to, to, um, to emerge. So we thought that ancient woodland uh, data sets would be a good proxy in the absence of anything else for ecological continuity. And then we added on all the dots here you can see on this map um this is the interactive map version which you can access via the url in the slide there um all the dots in this map are showing um lichen records for a uh, set of indicator species of oceanic lichens uh, and also bryophytes as well that were um, supplied to us by ben Averis, a fantastic biologist who's done a lot of work looking at temperate rainforests in scotland um, and then we um, pulled pulled in all of the um records for these uh, these indicator species from the National Biodiversity Network Atlas. Um, so clearly lots more work to be done on this. Um, it'd be great if others wanted to take up the baton and look at things like microclimates, rainforest or the temperate rainforest-like habitats might be surviving and thriving outside of the main temperate rainforest zone, um, you know, areas where 
sort of aspect and uh, uh, and uh, uh, sheltered sheltered ravines and so on, places like that where the microclimate might be allowing uh, oceanic species of lichens and graphites to thrive as well. But um, what these maps of initial maps have allowed us to do is also to try and start to influence policymakers because say, well, you know, natural England, uh, you say you're protecting these some of these uh, very precious sites, but actually uh, by comparing the maps that we've made with where triple size uh, sites of special scientific interest currently exist, um, around three quarters of temperate rainforests in England, we think, are actually lying outside of protected designations and so do not benefit from those legal protections. So given that this temperate rainforest zone covers, covers <clears throat> around 20% of the country, but we only have 1% uh, rainforest left, what happens to our rainforests? Well, unfortunately, Britain is a rainforest nation that arguably cut down most of its rainforests. And it may have started doing so many centuries ago, even millennia back in the Bronze Age, when um, Bronze Age farmers started to clear um, many of the forests, many, much of the wildwood for agriculture. Uh, and obviously, I can't get too upset about that. That did take place a long time ago. And it was obviously something that was being done you know, for subsistence agriculture. Um, but uh, what I think I can get justifiably a bit more angry and about is uh, un unforgivably how some of our temperate rainforest fragments were cut down as recently as the 20th century um, by modern forestry practices. And um, some of them were even, in fact, felled by none other than the Dartington Estate, which is uh, near where I now live in, in Totnes, um, a, uh, an estate that's um, kind of a bit of a byword for environmental sustainability these days. But back in the 1930s, um, when uh, shortly after it was taken over by the Elmhurst, who were kind of quite a bohemian couple who wanted to uh, regenerate and revive this estate and make it work for, in the 20th century. Um, what they did was that they um, uh, acquired a whole load of, of, of ancient, uh, ancient woodlands, um, many of them Atlantic Oakwoods, um, in the temperate rainforest zone on the edges of Dartmoor. And they hired an economist from none other than Oxford University who uh, advised them that the best thing to do would be to cut them all down and replace them with uh, profit-making conifer plantations instead. And this is this is the chap here, uh, uh, um, uh, the economist uh, Wilfred Hiley, who whose work for Dart the Dartington State went on to influence much of modern forestry in the 1930s. Uh, you know, arguably uh, it was the Bohemians who first cut down a rainforest in this country. Um, and set the set the stage for the post-war era in which forestry and intensive farming led to um, what Oliver Rackham estimated to be the loss of about a third of all of our ancient woodlands, simply between the years 1950 and 1980. So um, a huge tragedy, and we're still living with the after effects of that today. But after the axes in, in came the livestock to complete the destruction. And you've heard of rainforest beef and what it's done uh, to the Amazon. Well, this is our version of it. It's rainforest mutton. Um, this is this is one of the one of the one of the denizens overlooking uh, the, the rainforest, the dark valley, uh, eyeing up its next meal. Um, and sheep, in particular, being a non-native species to the UK, are I, I would say a particular problem for um, uh, reducing and uh, uh, if affecting natural the natural particularly of our temperate rainforests, um, more so than cattle because um, sheep do seem to particularly select for uh, young saplings and uh, nibble, nibble vegetation down to a very tight sward. And uh, this to me is why sheep are such a menace and why often you find native breeds of cattle being used in conservation grazing projects rather than sheep. But, you know, you might look at uh, on, a, on a flock of sheep and go, well, they're surely just sort of now a well accustomed and natural and normal part of the uh, British landscape. Well. I hope I can disabuse you of that notion by showing you a map of sheep density in Europe. And this, according to the European Food Safety Authority, I believe, is um, quite how many sheep there are in Europe. And you can see that Britain is truly world beating when it comes to sheep. Um, and um, gets even more of a problem, a problem when we zoom in on data for Britain alone. And we see that, unfortunately, 
where there's the highest density of sheep according to DEFRAs from survey data I think um, there is also it, it happens to be a correlation with the areas where the climate is best for temperate rainforest and that actually of course is not any not a coincidence because if you speak to any farmer in the west of Britain they will tell you that the west of Britain is of course brilliant for growing grass and for palm problem is that in my view it's even better for growing rainforest so that's something we need to contend with if we want to bring them back and this is an example of a rainforest that is dying and nearly nearly past nearly dead um, this is actually uh, a, remains of a, an ancient birch wood um, that uh, an ecologist uh, found up in uh, the highlands of Scotland that's been browsed not just by sheep but by deer there are about a million deer um, marauding across uh, across Scotland to um, the absence of any natural predators and decades of mismanagement by sporting estates who've allowed them to get out of control and the government hasn't sufficiently stepped in to, to instigate a cull as yet. Uh, and uh, you know what's really happened here is that this wood will of course have attempted to reproduce and send out <coughs> seeds and produce saplings over the decades but all of them will have been uh, nibbled by deep deer and by sheep and uh, these are the last veteran trees creaking on their last legs and what we end up with is you know of course it, it, it's all these very many small tiny fragments of of temperate rainforest many of them marooned up, marooned up hillsides uh, in the middle of moorlands and lacking in ecological connectivity and because so many of our rainforest fragments have disappeared even completely nibbled to death I think we need to undertake some to track down their remains. So I feel we need to call on the help of some detectives in order to do so. Um, who find her to call on them? Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson here, looking out for ghostly hounds in the fog of Dartmoor. And I, 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 brought, I bring in this analogy because um, one of the world's experts on temperate rainforests, Dominic de la Sala, has written about this and said, he's written these words, because very few rainforests remain throughout Europe, they have not received much attention. Those undertaking rescue efforts today operate much like detectives in search of clues. So I found that uh, a very exciting uh, passage to read when I first read it and thought, well, perhaps we can, more of us should be becoming landscape detectives and starting to look for clues for ancient rainforests, lost rainforests in the landscape. And there's a nice link here because the Sherlock Holmes novel, The Hounds of the Baskervilles, which is, of course, set on Dartmoor, um, contains an oblique reference to the temperate rainforest fragment of Wistman's Wood. In one passage, Dr. to and I quote, the stunted oaks, which had been twisted and bent by the fury of years of storm. And elsewhere in the novel, he described a Devon Holloway, heavy with dripping moss and fleshy heart's tongue fern. And I think such descriptions clearly sprang from when Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, the author, uh, visited Dartmoor in about 1902 and perhaps even visited Wistman's Wood. But whilst the Hound of the Baskervilles has Holmes and Watson looking for a spectral ghostly hound, there's something else that haunts Dartmoor today. It's the, the haunting uh, spectre of ghost woods. And ghost woods is a term um, invented and popularised by the ecologist Ian Rotherham to describe woods that are now lost. The trees may no longer be there, but evidence for them, clues can be found to them in the landscape still, and they can be found in places, th things like old place names. So I started looking for these ghost woods on maps of Dartmoor. Um, some of them are quite obvious, places like Birch Tour. There are no birch trees left on Birch Tour, but perhaps we may assume once in the past they were. Uh, others are a bit more obscure. There are various, a cluster of villages uh, and woods to the north of Dartmoor called, all, all with the uh, suffix Nymet, or variations on that theme. And the word Nymet, I, I think, indicates a Celtic sacred grove maybe a, a former wood that existed there um, it, it, at some point in the distant past. And I started to spot lots of place names around Dartmoor with the name bear. And bear doesn't mean bear in the modern sense of, of a, big, <laughs> a big mammal, but uh, in fact is Anglo-Saxon for wood. Um, so in looking for ghost woods on Dartmoor, you're actually going on a bear hunt. Um, and you can find them even, even opposite Wisman's Wood, there is a place called Bear Down, and maybe referring simply to the existence of Wisman's Wood, or perhaps it is referring to the fact that the wood wants the other side of the valley as well. And the word Dartmoor itself contains 
a hint as to its formerly more wooded nature. Today, um, most of it is very treeless. If you've ever done the 10 tours, hikes, or Duke of Edinburgh there, you'll know how you can go for miles and miles and not see a tree at all. But dart derives from uh, the Celtic word deru, meaning oak. And so the dart, the, oak, the river along which the oak trees grow, and perhaps once was a much more wooded place uh, itself as well. Um, continuing the rather gothic theme that we've now entered into, I wanted to show you the bones of a rainforest, not the, of course, the bones of this rather poor Dartmoor pony in the, in the foreground, but in the uh, in the background and on the horizon there is, is a place called Fir Tor. And anyone who's ever tried to hike to Fir Tor will know how far away it is from anywhere else. It's right in the middle of the moor, very, very far from any other tree or wood. But perhaps once upon a time, it did have, because um, the, renowned chronicler of Dartmoor, William Crossing, wrote in his famous guide to Dartmoor about a century ago, below Fertor on the Cutcoom side is a spot known to the Moor men as Fertor Wood. The name seems to point to the former existence of trees in this sheltered hollow, and the discovery a few years ago of oak buried in the peat nearby proves that they once grew around here. Now, of course, the peat, uh, the bog oak that he was referring to, would have been thousands of years old, but perhaps clues to the more recent existence of, uh, of woods in the landscape can be discerned through looking for indicator species that may represent the um, remaining seed banks of former woodlands. So some ecologists have, uh, thought, have, have, have think that things like bluebells and wood sorrel and bracken may be indicators of, of woodland soils, even in areas where trees no longer grow. Um, and I think this is something that could benefit from more research. Perhaps one of you will, will, will do this. Um, but I, I would love to know more about whether there are the, the sort of where the balance of opinion on this lies. But if we are to see, see bracken particularly as an indicator of former woodlands, perhaps we might be able to use maps of bracken as a way to guide restoration efforts. And bracken, when it forms a dense monoculture, a dense stand, certainly cannot be said to be produce, providing um, uh, high quality, high productivity farmlands. It's uh, unpalatable to most livestock and be poisonous to some of them. And so farmers will tend to uh, try and get rid of it in, in, if, they can, uh, if, if they can do. Uh, but uh, if it's an indicator of woodland soils, perhaps it's the soils telling us that we should be allowing those areas to ultimately regenerate. So this is a map of uh, where we think bracken exists on Dartmoor these days, clearly not occurring on the deep peat and the, um, you know, the blanket bog in the center of the moor, but seemingly you might expect there to be woodland sort of feathering up the edges of the wood of, of the hills and along the river valleys and um some work being done by the center for ecology and hydrology at the moment looking uh, at trying to produce more accurate bracken maps but again that's something where i think more uh, more research could be done uh, and would be very helpful because if if this has been a bit gloomy up until now talking about sort of ghosts and bones and how many of our rainforests we've got rid of i hope it's actually a more actually about trying to find those clues of, for former rainforests and former woods in the landscape and allowing them to, um, to, to return, allowing uh, us to, to, to resurrect them and to breathe life back into these lost landscapes. And you know, I have hope because I think the fact that we still have, do have fragments of rainforest gives us um, a set of, of reservoirs, a set of, sort of lifeboats from, upon which we can perhaps uh, allow them to, to, to recolonize parts of the landscape. Um, you know, if we simply to start to restrict grazing around some of our fragments of temperate rainforest, I think we'll start to see some um, pretty pretty rapid effects. And we can do that in you know, fairly basic ways by sheltering saplings with tree guards um, or putting in exposure fencing, or perhaps we might be able to find um, more you know, novel technologies that might come to our aid, such as the use of uh, GPS tracking collars um, apply, uh, being put onto livestock as this trial and RSPB Horsewater in the Lake District is, is trialling with some uh, this herd of Belted Galloway cattle and the use of virtual fencing in places where it's very difficult politically to put in um, fencing such as on commons. And as Oliver Rackham, um, one of our greatest um, historians of our woods said, in England trees grow where people have not prevented them. Well, we have prevented them from growing in large parts of the country uh, owing to ultimately to overgrazing. And when we restrict that overgrazing, we can start to like this one here in Snowdonia, 
um, where simply a fence was put in on a hillside about 20 or 30 years ago. And sheep obviously can still get in over here, but over here they've been excluded. And this is very, far, very, very far away from a seed source, not close to a nearby wood, but birds and uh, other, other animals have clearly spread seeds there. Rowans, uh, birch are starting to colonize the fells as, as are other, um, other species, uh, bracken and so on. And I found an interesting example of this taking place um, it, not so far from where I live, a place called Lustily Cleave, which um, has regenerated uh, what I've called an accidental rainforest over the last, uh, certainly the last couple of centuries, and uh, particularly in the last um, few decades. And actually, this is a process of regeneration that we can track through historical records. Um, mm -hmm. The first, these, these aren't very clear, but the first of these um, images shows you a painting from 1820. Um, and because, of course, the, um, the geology of the cleave hasn't changed, but even though the ecology has, we can track it through history, we can match up the rocks to um, present day. And we can see that by the time of the Edwardians taking this uh, tourist photograph as a postcard in 1907, we can start to see vegetation um, cresting up the side of this tour. And when I went back there in 2021 and tried to track down the same location that the painting had been, uh, had been painted and the photograph taken, I couldn't really find it because there were so many trees in the way. So that's happened through a, an accident of history, uh, through a common regenerating, partly because um, of demographic change in the area, um, essentially, uh, quite a lot of the common grazing rights now belong to people who have bought up properties, um, who are retirees, they have no desire or interest in becoming um, farmers or part-time farmers, and that's just led to a, a reduction in grazing in the area. Um, but obviously we can't necessarily expect this sort of accident to happen, and, and perhaps nor should we want it to. We really, to restore rain, rainforest and, and nature more generally in, in Britain, I think we should be aiming to do it deliberately, not just through abandoning land and, and hoping for the best. And so this is where I think it comes into talking about how do we get governments to intervene? How do we get uh, governments to change and shift farm <laughs> subsidies that they've been talking about now for many years of doing, but are still wavering to incentivize landowners and farmers to do the right thing and to be rewarded for restoring nature. Because if we were to do so, not just um, in small patches, but uh, across larger areas, this shows you where um, deciduous woodland still exists on uh, in Dartmoor National Park, um, but if we were to allow it to expand um, by, let's say, 100 to 150 metres on all sides, um, you would see quite dramatic effects, not just the uh, more rainforest, more temperate uh, woodland, but uh, also, of course, greater connectivity between those fragments of woodland, and um, obviously that's incredibly important for building ecological resilience to the impact of things like climate change and, um, and diseases and so on. And I, I chose that, um, that distance uh, as a buffer um, because a study was published last year um, by CEH looking at um, a study plots at Monk's Wood in Cambridgeshire um, of where an oak wood has been allowed to regenerate with uh, grazing pressure taken off of it. And in 20 years, the oak woods have spread outwards by roughly 100 to 150 meters, um, carried that far by jays and squirrels burying the acorns and allowing the, the saplings to regenerate. So I think this is something that's entirely possible. And if we were to do that across the whole country, we could actually double the area of our temperate rainforest within a generation. Of course, it would take far longer for some of those amazing species of lichens and bryophytes to spread to them. But if you're allowing those ancient woods to, um, to grow outwards, surely ultimately what you would end up having is, is not just uh, the trees spreading, but ultimately they would become, uh, I guess, a vector for the other plants and uh, fungi and so on as well. So I think that's what we're trying to do. That's what I've been calling for. And ultimately, I think we need political change to uh, get this to happen as well, which is why over the last 18 months or so, of course, we've been campaigning, set up a campaign called Lost Rainforest of Britain, colleagues in an organisation called Seahorse Environmental, to try and lobby politicians, lobby the government, get ministers interested in this, um, and try to get them to, in the first instance, at least even acknowledge the existence of temperate rainforest, which they haven't done up until recently um, as something that exists in, in Britain and to start the process of getting more funding and greater protections according to, um, and this is something that um, would be great if everyone in this room wanted to get involved with. We haven't got that petition up and running anymore that, that expired um, uh, earlier in the year, but I'm sure we will do at some point. 
And if nothing else, just getting your MP out and taking them out into nature, whether you live near a rainforest or not, I think is probably quite a good way to get them out of the Westminster bubble and actually into something that's a bit more real um, and getting them thinking about um, about rainforests and, and other ways, other forms of nature recovery would be brilliant. So I think that we should be getting the government to set a, a, a goal of doubling these rainforests within a generation. Um, I've been hugely inspired by these amazing uh, habitats and you know, feel very, very lucky to have um, spent time in so many of them. And I hope you feel inspired as well to take up this fight and get involved, whether that's through carrying out fresh research or lobbying politicians or anything else you want to do. But obviously, firstly, I hope that you just buy my book. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you, Mike. Thanks. Beautiful slide. It's fascinating to hear your know, work really pioneering awareness of this of lost bio. Um, so we've got time for questions, so feel free to follow away there. And I'll, uh, if you're online as well, I can uh, feel something online as well. Uh, any questions uh, uh, at the end there? Hi. Um, this is kind of a nitpicky question, but it, it stuck out to me, and um, I've been obsessing over it for the rest of the talk. Um, I'm just curious um, how, how you're defining or where the line is regarding native species for sheep and cattle, because as far as I'm aware, cattle were also introduced, livestock cattle were also introduced from mainland Europe. Uh, and I was wondering what the time period was and how it differed from sheep. Yeah, sure. Um, very good question. And I guess um taking issue is is more the stocking density of any livestock more than anything else. Um, my understanding is, and um, could well be wrong on this, but that, that sheep were introduced more recently. Um, and that also that uh, cattle, particularly certain breeds of cattle, are perhaps closer uh to kind of aurochs and so on, um, uh, which we did have here uh, since since the last ice age. So um, I wouldn't want to be <laughs> absolutely, uh, you know, sort of logical about that, but I, I think probably in terms of um, the sheep have on, on uh, preventing regeneration of saplings is, is probably worse than with cattle, but ultimately the stocking densities are, are clearly uh, too high and that's that's the main issue really. I'll take one from online from mm -hmm. Lucas Patish. Uh, what's been the reception of policymakers? Have you spoken to any investors or similar interested to buying back land for such a company? Two questions there. Yeah, sure. Um, well, um, certainly there's been a good response from some policymakers, and some ministers are very excited by this and sort of get interested and start saying some warm words, and then they get sacked. <laughs> or government falls and another government comes in. So it's quite hard to kind of get any sort of sense of sensible policy and continuity at the moment. Um, I think, uh, as we were talking about actually earlier, Edwinda, there's, there's more interest, I think, in Scotland uh, about this. There's obviously some incredible temperate rainforests in Scotland, and there's perhaps been acknowledgement of that there for, for longer. Um, and so, you know, organisations like Nature Scott are kind of talking about temperate rainforests um, far more freely than perhaps natural England is. Perhaps we should be, you know, seeking to, to get natural England to adopt it as a term and, and use it as a useful term. Um, but, um, I mean, in terms of investors, uh, uh, Yes, there are there are various um, private landowners as well as the sort of more usual suspects at places like the National Trust and Woodland Trust, who are starting to get interested in this. Um, there's a, uh, a, a land landowner in Cornwall um, with the very appropriate name of Merlin Hanby Tennyson, who has got very interested in Celtic rainforest and how to starting to kind of revamp his entire business model for the estate and farm he looks after, um, and and work out how to how to kind of restore rainforest alongside. Um, making it, you know, turning a profit as a business. So, yeah, I'm encouraged by things like that. But yeah, I think ultimately we need to get policy change in order to incentivize more more farmers, particularly, of course, sheep farmers, um, to do the right thing. So, yeah. Just to follow up on one sort of policy change that you're pushing for. Yeah, sure. So, so a number of things. So, um, firstly, that in England, the environmental land management scheme that's being discussed as a, you know, um, to replace the common agricultural policy. Um, it's ongoing debate seems to be rumbling on for years now, um, just on the cusp of when we're actually meant to be transitioning to this new system and uh, the old, old old payments are finally being wound down. Um, uh, concerned that so some of the initial ambition that people like Michael Gove had for it, uh, the sort of public money for public goods is being kind of lost and we're going to see, starting to see a rollback on, on that. Perhaps we'll end up simply replicating what we once had when we were part of the EU and sort of 
payments. But I hope that um, they'll retain a more uh, ambitious tier, the landscape recovery tier within ELMS, and that that will be the sort of thing which allows uh, landowners and, and, and uh, farmers over, over kind of whole, whole landscapes to kind of join up and do things like rainforest restoration. Uh, but besides that, also just simply, you know, extending the network of protected sites, you know, there's clearly far too few of them. Um, you know, the government got this ambition of protecting 30% of England and, and I think uh, Britain overall as well um, uh, by 2030 for nature. And uh, we're probably at something like 3% at the moment if you go by triple size that are actually in a good good condition. So they've clearly got a long way to go and they need to actually be funding our you know, uh, environmental watchdogs better to be able to enforce those um, protections as well. So those are some of the sorts of policies we're trying to change. Thank you. More questions? Uh... Thank you, Zoe, for um, My question is around, or have you done any work with the into how climate change may affect the suitability of the small spaces that previously may have made rainforests, or potentially if the UK has become wetter? Uh, if there are new areas of land that might be suitable for, for rainforest colonies, or going to encourage? Good question, and I haven't. Um, I'm almost sort of slightly uh, dare not to look, really. But um, clearly, we are going to. We clearly we are having you know huge changes in our climate, and um, clearly, as well as having wetter winters, we're getting drier and hotter summers. And you know, when I visited some of the temporary rainforest sites that I showed you earlier this summer during the heat wave, some of them were looking pretty crispy and dry around the edges and not looking in a great shape. So yes, that's my great fear is that. Um, uh, that some of these sites will will simply dry up and and cease to have many of the um, graphites and lichens that make them of, of interest um, in future. But I also, I guess I also have hope that allowing them to expand, that we're going to improve their resilience and allow sort of migration of species within them as well. And it's possible, and again, it'd be great if someone wanted to run the, run the figures and run the maps and look at what uh, some of the most plausible scenarios are now for, for climate impacts, they could, uh, we could see where that zone might shift in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'll take one from another one from Bonner and Bay uh, Linking together your two areas of research on land ownership and more. Uh, the only danger of these incentives could create a new form of tree rent and may legitimize unequal land ownership as landowners become stewards of the land. Um, yes. Perhaps. <laughs> uh, I guess uh, what I think about stewardship is that it would be a good idea and that lots of landowners um, sort of use the notion of environmental stewardship as a kind of way to justify continued ownership of land. Um, but uh, whilst that may, may be the case for some landowners, I think it's often something that most landowners are not held to. It's not something that they're scrutinised about. Uh, and, um, you know, at, at the very least, if we're not going to see a sort of um, great changes in terms of land reform, particularly in England, where obviously uh, there hasn't been a discussion about land reform as there has been in Scotland um, up until now. Um, at the very least, I think we should be asking landowners to um, be good stewards of the land and uh, do what you know ultimately we are paying them to do in terms of um, publicly public subsidies. Um, but uh, you know what I what I think also might happen in future, I hope happens in future in, in England and Wales, as has been happening in Scotland, is that there's a greater community buy into land, uh, that we get uh, reformed um, uh, community right to buy in England, something that Labour has promised they're going to do if they get into government at some point. So perhaps that's something we might see here. We might see more efforts to um, essentially allow more of the public to become stewards and custodians of the land, the landowners who they currently are. Thank you. Hi, um, so thank you, that's fantastic. Absolutely love having the questions. Um, so, so there's two things I was, I was um, just wondering about. The first is ancient mossy woodlands that are outside the rainforest, the official rainforest zone, so in England or Midlands, or how do they fit into the overall picture of what you're talking about? And the other thing is, um, Rainforests, temperate rainforests throughout Europe. Have we kind of got a map of those, and how they can we fit into that? Yeah, I mean, on the first of those, I, I assume, as I say, I'm not a trained ecologist here, but I assume that there is a, uh, and others in the room could probably talk far more authoritatively about this. But I assume there will be a, there will be a, a, a gradation, and that you will get certain species 
occurring in other parts of Britain as well. But certainly in some of those, you know, really characteristic oceanic species of lichens and liverworts and mosses do tend to occur within the main area where we've shown in terms of the rainfall uh, and, and, uh, and sort of the hydrothermy there, the kind of interplay of, of mild uh, mild weather and, um, and and very rainy weather. Uh, and um, but um, you know clearly there are places such as in the Gill Woodlands of Sussex where some of these oceanic species of lichens have also been found. Uh, what what is that? Is that a, a separate sort of habitat, or are they relics of a previous kind of previous Atlantic climate? Or does it does it matter? Perhaps not. Um, uh, in terms of temperate rainforest across Europe, um, I'm led to believe there are some in parts of Norway uh, and possibly. Uh, possibly even northern Spain, although they must be very different there in Glacier. Um, but certainly in um, we find uh, rainforests that are very similar to the ones which are in the west of Britain. And um, uh, there's also a book out this year um, about Irish rainforests by a guy called Owen Dutton. So plug his book as well. Definitely have a read of it. It's really good. And he's on Twitter as at Irish Rainforest and <laughs> usually tweets loads of great pictures of, of the temperate rainforest he looks after. So, yeah, check him out. Mm -hmm. I can just shout, it's fine, all right. Um, cool, thank you very much. Um, I'm just wondering, with the loss of deer, sorry, if you have lots of deer browsing around, would that, um, if you have too many deer, would it just like wipe out the rainforest like you showed in your picture? Um, is that a contribution to like rainforest decline and just like things out there to have a rainforest? In which case, how much of a, a functional ecosystem is it without large herbivores? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, deer are clearly a massive problem, particularly in Scotland. Um, as I say, I think I think the latest figures are something like a million deer um, of all, uh, all all types are kind of now um, in Scotland, um, and I mean ultimately. Those numbers need to be brought down, and until we uh, bite the bullet and reintroduce wolves and lynx, uh, we're going to have to cull them, and that needs, you know, that needs to be grappled with. Um, I think we should be eating far more venison, to be honest, um, but doing so in a way that doesn't also encourage the farming of deer. So I think, you know, we need, to, you know, we need to eat down that that population of of deer, really, um, but also. Um, yeah, we can you can put in fences, but obviously, yeah, with deer fencing particularly, it's huge cost, huge amount of work. Um, and as you say, you know, ultimately have a woodland that's hugely overgrazed, um, but if, equally it's also natural for a wood to have no animals in it. So clearly we do need disturbance. There's certainly a very valid uh debate about what's the right le level of grazing pressure within a mature woodland or wood pasture. Certainly, once you've got a woodland that's established, um you may well want there to be um, a certain amount of grazing going on within it and browsing because uh you know of opening up light levels for many of these species of lichens that are very um you know sort of shade intolerant so i think that's you know uh, it's something that is is a, is a tricky balance to get um it's much trickier that because we have uh so many tiny fragments left rather than actually serious serious forests of any great size in which you would get that natural variation and you would get sort of obviously naturally occurring kind of glades and areas of disturbance and areas of more closed canopy woodlands. So yeah, lots of problems to try and resolve, but certainly um, bringing down the numbers of... Thank you. Yeah, I'll take another one from online, from Harry Stone, who works in small-scale regenerative forestry in Cornwall. Mm -hmm. And he was wondering how the doubling of rainforest cover in the UK works with the need to relocalize our wood economies and phase out fossil fuels. Is there a space to manage some of these forests? It could be, yeah. I mean, I think we probably need more forestry in the, in the UK as well. We import something like eighty percent of our wood, um, so we're clearly very dependent on the, you know, our, our, our wood footprint, as if you like, is just in this country. But I, I think, um, you know, I, I would, I guess, I would. Uh, I'm not sure the point of restoring rainforests would be to then just simply cut it down again. <laughs> um, it's possible, I guess, you could do some. There could be certain forest forest products, I guess, that you could harvest maybe sustainably from. From restored temperate rainforest, possibly a little bit of you know a few more hazelnuts, maybe, <laughs> um, maybe as I say, talk, talking about you know venison and deer. I, I think ultimately though we should be doing this because 
Uh, it's an amazing ecosystem in its own right, and all of the ecosystem services that it uh, provides, carbon storage and so on, the biodiversity value, and just because it's amazing. And mm -hmm. and, and I think we should um, be sort of unapologetic in in talking about ecosystems as being uh, objects of awe and wonder. Yeah. And you know, I didn't really talk about it here, but a lot of my book is about the kind of cultural importance of temperate rainforests because I think they are written into our history and our myths in this country. And I think reclaiming that is perhaps to perhaps argue back against um, some of who I think of as being slightly heritage fanatics in some of our national parks who uh, like to preserve the Lake District in, as, a, as a cultural landscape, which is an entirely unnatural overgrazed one. So, you know, yes, we, it needs to be balanced alongside food production, but I do think there's plenty of space for the rainforest to be restored and, you know, for us to continue to produce food here. Okay. Uh, Hi, um, love the talk. Uh, you spoke on plant blindness. I was wondering if there was a particular experience where plants were revealed to you, and um, <laughs> and uh, also um, how you would encourage other people to see plants and their diversity. Thanks. Yeah. Um. Well, I don't know if it was a particular occurrence. It was more just um, during lockdown, starting to get, you know, just looking around my local area more and starting to name, get to learn the names of wildflowers, really finding a, you know, fairly common species of orchid in a hedge. But I was just like, wow, I didn't realise we had that here at all. So that sort of simple um, reconnection, I guess. I love the work that the rebel botanists did during lockdown where they chalked the names of, uh, you know, so-called weeds on the pavements of cities and you know kind of reacquainted people with the fact that there is biodiversity all around this but you know I think um you know more of that uh making it clearly relevant to everyone's every as well as restoring it to you know its place in the curriculum its place in um in you know in 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 the syllabus from a very early age really so I think you know it'd be great to see that yeah. um... I'm so jealous that you've got to spend all this time in your clothes. <laughs> I don't actually have that much work about it. Yeah. But um, I just a, a question, maybe less technical, more emotive, which is one you know, the time spent in rainforest. If you could come here and sort of a go home message for us, and just wondering if you can sort of speak from the rainforest, what if you can't come here today to say? <laughs> Gosh, uh, I don't think I can be like the Lorax and speak for the trees, but but it's certainly maybe I should speak for the lichens. Um, but no, I I think they're um they're just they're just incredible places to be in. I mean, uh, you know, it doesn't matter really what you know what aspect of nature you know turns you on, as it were. You know, it's if you if you find you know near spiritual experience in a in a wildflower meadow or a salt marsh, that's great as well. I just happened to me that I when I moved to the West Country that. Um, you know, I found these wet woodlands to be amazing places all year round. You know, they're green all year round, they drip all year round. Um, it's kind of a great place to be in winter because, you know, they're, they're, they're just almost at their best at that time of year. And, um, you know, I think, uh, yeah, I'm sure what I, what I hope they are thinking and, and they, they, they're wanting is, uh, is for more people to appreciate them. Obviously, if you do visit them, do so with the you know utmost respect, please, and you know don't just uh, don't leave any litter, but also pick up anything you find when you go to them. But I think more importantly is that you know we've got to um, work to try and restore them to pressure our fairly unimaginative representatives in House of Commons to do something about them. Uh, okay. <laughs> Really going back to a couple of questions ago, but the question about large herbivores in the recent, of course, there is that little explosion which is now sort of ground holding every bone and mosses. The other thing that you didn't touch on is how they were managed in the past, because an awful lot of them had a history of coppicing and charcoal making and all sorts of other things. Yeah, no, absolutely. And and I'm, I'm not uh, seeking to sort of say that. Um, that the only way forward is to entirely rewild, uh, that there is no such, you know, usefulness of human management of some of these habitats or human intervention. Um, uh, and you're absolutely right, of course, <laughs> uh, that uh, the exclosure in Westman's Wood is, is perhaps been shown to be, um, you know, useful for uh, encouraging more brambles, but perhaps not so good for the lichens, which actually make it a slightly special scientific interest. I suppose 
what I wonder if there is a way to um, uh, overcome that, uh, that, that that problem is is perhaps to focus our efforts on the on the outskirts of some of the woods and to instead of expecting there to be too much regeneration of oak underneath the canopy of the oak, which is unlikely to happen, I guess, but to try and uh, protect more of the saplings that are occurring on the edge. Um, and then at the same time, allow that kind of controlled grazing to continue within um, the mature woodlands. But I'd love to ask you more about that later because you know a lot more about this than me. <laughs> um, and um, yeah, and certainly also about the management and certainly, you know, clearly as some um, various studies have shown, you know, just simply leaving a wood to its own devices without any animals in it uh, doesn't necessarily add to the biodiversity of it. So um, I think we probably have to reintroduce some of the missing species as well. Um, and that don't not, not simply expect the kind of impoverished landscape to, to right itself without our intervening. Mm -hmm. Hi, so I actually live up close to what nice and Darcy things uh, very special place to me. And um, I have some family here that um, are uh, farmers in the local area. And I was interested to know, um, obviously policy is one way that we can um, get at this problem, but I was wondering whether you had ideas where we could uh, engage landowners and farmers in a way that's going to be potentially fast tracked in, in passing policy. I wondered whether you could shed insight into uh, whether there's been a lot of interest with uh, local farmers in actually beginning to make changes on the ground running that she's starting now, you know, going forward. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I mean, you know, I think um, uh, certainly there are there are farmers on the outskirts of Dartmoor who are, who are interested in this. There's a farmer cluster, um, sort of, you know, kind of group of farmers who are kind of trying to link up across the kind of wider landscape. I think even talking about um, trying to start to create a second Wisman's Wood on the banks of the East Dart. Uh, rather than the uh, West Dart, or possibly I've got the two confused, but one of the, one of the banks of the Dart. Um, but um, uh, that they, you know, they're clearly interested there from a perspective of being, you know, farmers, productive farmers, but also interested in restoring more nature to their to their land. Um, perhaps some of those farmers are, I think they're probably mostly tenant farmers, so they're sort of um, not not necessarily kind of quite so caught up in some of the politics of the Dartmoor Commons, which can be very uh, vexed and quite difficult to get agreement because there's uh, obviously dozens, if not hundreds, of of commoners uh, kind of involved in some of those discussions. But um, you know, I think sometimes it's about institutional inertia. A lot of the land on Dartmoor is owned by the Duchy of Cornwall, and you know they've been around for 700, 800 years and seem to move quite slowly. Um, so getting getting them as a landlord to be on side with allowing some of these changes is what. And there's clearly interest amongst some of their tenants, but uh, including things like you know, reintroducing beavers. But I don't think. Uh, well, see, it's no longer Prince Charles, but he wasn't particularly keen on reintroducing uh, missing species when he was the Duke of Cornwall. But perhaps Prince William might be. Um, and certainly, I think, um, you know, perhaps if we're starting by talking about plants and fungi rather than leaping straight to the apex predators, perhaps that might be a way in to get uh, slightly more, slightly more farmers, uh, you know, involved uh, rather than some of the sort of slight culture wars I think we've seen recently around. You know, rewilding versus sheep farming but obviously there needs to be that debate and there does need to be you know the economic incentives changed if we're going to see a reduction in grazing pressures on, on parts of the um, landscape where we want to see uh, regeneration occurring but it'd be great to chat afterwards as well Thanks. Um, you just mentioned the Dutch of Cornwall, which just made me think thinking about your previous work about in these kind of particular environments. Have you looked at the concentration of animal ownership? I mean, is it still in the kind of states that you've done Scotland? Or, 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 or. Yeah, most of most of England is still tied up in pretty large estates, really. I mean, there's obviously, yeah, it, it differs according to where, where you are in the uplands. A lot of the uplands of England are particularly owned by large, uh, large estates, often large sporting estates. Um, but um, but also, you know, I mean, somewhere like the Lake District, about twenty percent of it is now owned by the National Trust. They've been buying it over the over the last century or so, and um, you know, obviously, they are starting to do quite a lot to try and uh, restore nature, restore um, temperate rainforest. But you know, even there, I think it's it's useful to encourage uh, large conservation organisations to be to, you know pro be progressive on this sort of stuff. There, obviously, National Trust comes under attack from all sides for everything all the time because everyone thinks they have a view of what National 
um, but obviously, particularly recently, they've been under uh, under under um, under pressure to, including I think there was an anti rewilding motion at their uh, AGM, but thankfully that was defeated. Um, but you know, getting if you're members of of any big organisation like that, just getting in touch and saying we'd like you to do this, it'd be great to do that um, to to restore rainforests and so on to rewild. That would be I think really helpful. But um, but yeah, there is certainly certainly a job of work to be done to to map out who owns all the remaining fragments of rainforest and to and and neighbouring land in order to you know best engage some of those people. Mm -hmm. Your mention of National Trust reminds me that every year we take a master's student to Borrowdale, mm. um, where there's a nice uh, experiment now of abandoned sheep mm -hmm. uh, um, yes. being regenerated. It was, yes. it's, it's, it, I think it's a swap by Bratton. Right, um, yeah. Things, things are beginning to come through up 20, 30 years. Mm. And so that's one of the challenges, I suppose, mm. in the expansion yeah. of these very interesting What are we just going to see Bracken yep. uh, taking over? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Suppressing. Yeah, or well, could you send in a send in wild boar to break up the stands and yes, yes. Um, yeah, create spaces yeah. within that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you, I mean, uh, that's you think what might be the way to do this to actually have pigs of all. Uh, I mean, somehow. clearly there's there's something else that needs to be done there to to yes. stop it becoming purely a monoculture. I mean, I guess some degree of assisted regeneration might help to shade out some of it, but yes. um, it's also surely a kind of yeah situation which you could start to have. Uh, you know, wood pasture systems being created, even if you're not going to get um, yeah, close canopy rainforests. I'm going to take a couple more. Yeah. Hello, guys. Um, first of all, I wanted to say I've actually got the book. Great. Um, right. Make sure I'm sure that before I'm going to endorse it. I think one of the things as well is that, uh, you know, it's been around. Uh, over the past years. And what it's doing is it's opening my eyes to what I've actually seen. I mean, only last month I was in a wooden nest there, or covered in moss, but in really quite a good shape that I was walking to. And I uh, just seemed to thank you for you know, opening my eyes to what we're actually talking about. You've got to know this. Um, one of my relatives um, spent the last, the last part of his working life at uh, Anton Sabo at the Dunham Rainforest Research Station. And um, the thought sitting here and listening to you this afternoon is that uh, I think it's a really good idea to see if we could actually establish an equivalent temperate rainforest research station here in, in, in the UK. Mm -hmm. um, you know, where the techniques, processes, and, and protocols that they've developed uh, you know, to research the, the top of the rainforest can actually be brought to bear on temperate rainforest and actually you know, develop the, the body of understanding that. You know, how it works, what's in it, and you know, and uh, you know, it be larger because we've been discussing it. So, uh, you know, that's a, a common thing that you're having a question. I think that might yeah, brilliant. That'd be, that'd be fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Carlton? Yeah. 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 Thank you so much for the talk. I was, I would like to go back to the climate change uh, issue. Well, just sort of curiosity. So I know that over the last few years in the UK, the number of fires has rise. And I was just curious to know if these fires have affected any of these remnants, or do you think they are at risk over well when the areas like Briar? Um yeah, just in terms of thinking if if, if we want to expand the area of these forests, how exposed they are yeah. um, to these yeah. fires. Yeah, for sure. I think it's probably true to say that a lot of the wildfires that we've seen in recent years, obviously, you know, starting to increase as an incidence of climate change, but also are, are occurring on uh, landscapes which are pretty mod heavily modified by by humans. So, you know, moorland areas, um, uh, gorse can you know can be can be very um, fire prone and headed and so on. And a lot of these are kind of grass moors which have been managed for that. And obviously, the grass moor managers say, well, we're managing the fuel load by taking off the heather and burning it occasionally and Sometimes those fires also get out of control, and if they're drying out the underlying peat, then that's uh, not not good for the um, you know, general wetness of that ecosystem, which which generally tends to, in a more natural state, um, buffer against wildfires. I think um, Oliver Rackham used to say that our, our deciduous woodland uh, would burn like wet asbestos. Um, in other words, not at all. Um, now, I was. Uh, he, Oliver Rackham did a study of. Uh, tend to, I think he tended to do most of his studies on 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 dry woodlands in the east of England, but 
he certainly did one study um, uh, of, of the Helford River woods in, um, in Western Cornwall, which uh, I think is probably a candidate for temperate rainforest and certainly very, very wonderful place. Um, and I was quite uh, shocked and surprised to hear that earlier this summer in the heat wave that we just had, there was a section of the Helford River woods and the predominantly oak woods that I think caught fire. Um, now I'm not quite sure because I couldn't find out from the news reports whether it was okay. that, whether it was a kind of nearby um, bit that had been turned into a conifer plantation that had caught fire. But obviously, mm -hmm. if that was the deciduous trees themselves, those are the oak trees themselves starting to catch fire, then perhaps Rackham's kind of uh, uh, rule of thumb on this no longer holds and may no longer hold in in a future of 1.5 or two degrees or more. So that's something that I think we should be very worried about and obviously should be doing everything to prevent. Um, but yeah, be something to look into, I think, as well. Hi, um, sorry, this is a bit more of a hijacking than a question. Um, just, uh, you spoke about, you know, ownership of land and I know that's obviously a topic that you've covered very extensively. Um, a friend who could not be here because she couldn't find it um, asked me to, to mention, you know, a fairly new group, uh, Land Justice Oxfordshire, who, you know, are looking at who does own Oxfordshire, especially in the context of, you know, the recent cost of living crisis and also the health impact of not having access to land, uh, which has itself involved the fair, well, some attendees have also done a fairly extensive mapping process of ownership in Oxford and Oxfordshire itself. Yeah. So thanks for raising that. And um, uh, I think there might be other people in the audience today who've done some of that mapping. I can see one of them over there. Um, and uh, and also, uh, I know that recently there's been a Land Justice Cambridge set up. So I'm glad you guys aren't uh, letting them pick you to post on that one. So yeah, <laughs> go for it. Okay. Okay, now I think uh, no more questions. I think we'll wrap up. Well, thank you. I like something that was very much. Thank you. Thank you. Well, just to, uh, just to remind you, there's drinks uh, uh, in, in the room just down the hallway there, uh, and I've got copies of guys' books, both books available there. So Great. we'll make sure we get some access for wine. <laughs> Thanks. So Thank you, everybody yeah. online. Thanks online. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.